because when you ask it something, it needs to compute before it says it says it back, and there's a pause. Okay, this language processor is so fast that it talks back right away, and sometimes it might even interrupt it so quick. Literally, Leo, I have yet to touch the keyboard. Right, I'm just talking to it, and I said, build slides. And it built the slides, and that's the slide that I used in my presentation. One of the goals of AI is not have you tell it what you want. One of the goals of AI is <gasps> this is amazing. So today I'm super excited to be with my good friend Leo Chen. Uh, Leo is the CEO of Systemology and a all-around amazing entrepreneur. Leo not only has uh, a great background in the technology world and being an amazing entrepreneur, but he's also a active real estate agent and investor. And he's figured out how to utilize AI, not just in a, in the, Hey, let's go put in a random prompt into chat GPT, but to actually make it work for us. So, uh, this is a series where I get to, uh, I get to get be coached by Leo, which is uh, really cool. And then the best part about all of this is that you get to see all the benefits of our discussion so you can learn from it as well. So Leo, man, I appreciate you. Thank you for doing this. Thanks, Sharon. Um, always good to talk to you. Yeah, man. Hey, so before we even kind of get into all of this, I want to ask you like a broad question. What, um, when this AI revolution happened not too long ago, when it became mainstream, something, something happened for you. Like you took you took to it, you started utilizing it, et cetera. What was that switch for you when you started seeing things happen? What made it interesting for you to say, hey, I think this is something that is important for me to learn more, do more, get more, get better at. Like what was the switch for you to spending more time learning and implementing the AI solutions? Um, the, the biggest thing for me, when I think about technology, I always think about like, how is it going to impact you know, my life and society, because if you can see how it's going to impact you, regardless of your choices going forward, right, then you have to embrace it. Yeah. Okay. And so uh, the, that's, that's kind of the moment where, where the, the realization happens and we have to just like, hey, like it or not, it's going to either be forced on us or we are going to be proactively leveraging it for our life, uh, provided that you understand it, right? And so... The understanding really was that now that we have all this technology up to this point in humanity, right, um, we can take all that stuff and it all can go into some sort of a um, easy to use uh, knowledge base, but also personal be, personal will be able to kind of communicate to you and be able to do anything based on that. That's that's a huge leap. Yeah. Right. Up to this point, we have to. We have to interact with the screen all the time and tell it what to do all the time. And we're spending, we're realizing we're spending all this time with all the different mediums and different softwares and different ways to do stuff. Where what if we can just talk to somebody like, a, like an ultimate assistant and say, can you do this, right? As opposed to having to go find the tools, learn the tools, do the tools uh, and all that, all that other jazz, which is consuming too much of our time. So I think once you realize that, it's almost as instantly realizable as realizing what the internet can do for you, what the yeah. internet does to society and the network. So this, this brings me to, uh, I'm in full agreement with you. This brings me to this, this broader question of context. And I'm starting to realize that I was of the impression that if I just figured out various ways in which different tools did things, oh, this school can do these three things, this tool can do these three things. I thought that was the answer. And I started out that way. But then I realized that there was a better, more contextual question to ask, which maybe you can help answer, which is what is, if, if there was like two or three pieces of news uh, or broad macro landscape in the AI world that we should know about, maybe with the LLMs, maybe with what other companies are doing, it feels like once you have context, all the tools start to fit in that context very well. So my question for you is, one, what is your thought around context? And two, what are like two or three kind of AI news based things that we should be aware of? Well, I'll, I'll go, you know, only, it sounds like forever because everybody's been talking about it so much. Only a couple of weeks ago, um, OpenAI released their latest uh, ChatGPT. And, um, you know, we still call it ChatGPT, but it's not just chat anymore, right? You can feed it images, you can feed it video, you can feed it diagrams, you can feed it your drawing, you can feed it all kinds of things to get something back. That is that that is a huge leap because for 2024, if all that OpenAI and ChatGPT did was to be able to bring in these other way 
that AI can be aware of information, not just through, through text, um, then that's a huge leap forward, right? right. So uh, AI, is, uh, open AI is trying to be the platform for the world, okay? Just like Google did. Google said, hey, we're going to be searchable information for the world. And so open AI is, you know, as far as I can see, my personal opinion is that they're going to be a platform for everything. You think about shopping, the platform of the world is Amazon. You think about traditionally searching, the platform, you know, for the world is Google. Uh, you think about Apple, uh, the platform for the world is the mobile phone, right? And uh, so now everything can plug into that platform. So OpenAI, when it released uh, ChatGPT 4.0, is actually a really big leap that they have been working on for years. And finally get to this point where things can come together and actually be usable. And then they made it available to everybody because again, it's the platform that's valuable, okay? Not whether they charge you a subscription or not, okay? Yeah. And then uh, to add on top of that, it's two times faster than the latest ChatGPT 4O plus turbo. <laughs> and then 50% cheaper for those who are transacting and creating APIs from it. So that's a huge news. That's a that's a big thing because literally everybody else is going to plug into that platform. Um, so that's number one. Um, if you've been around and you like Apple products, you would know that Apple had uh, released their iOS 18 just over. You know, it's their annual thing to do the to do the developers to give the developers new stuff to work on, and they announced that they finally make this huge jump into um, AI for their world. They call it uh, Apple intelligence rather than artificial intelligence, but that's just that's just their marketing for you. Um, and so the three things that's most important on that is a integrated AI into your iPhone, all your Apple products, okay, via text. So you're always going to have a AI interfacing with you on email, on texting, on writing, on notes, on anything that you're doing. So there now is a layer of AI between you and any kind of app that Apple provides. Okay, that's huge. That's number one. We've been probably waiting for that, you know, since day one. Like, hey, why do I have to go to OpenAI or ChatGPT to type in an answer when I go back to my iPhone and back and forth? Now it's going to be integrated into iPhone. So a lot of the tools over time are going to be consolidated into these big platforms like, you know, Apple. Okay, number two, they integrated image editing within the phone. <laughs> so that means you, all the photos that you take, okay, you can now uh, erase you know, people out of the background. Uh, you can do certain different things. You can maybe change the uh, look and feel. Uh, they always had filters before, but now the filters are actually AI generated. Okay, so able, that's a huge thing for uh, uh, phone users is all of their photos and be able to organize them and be able to summarize them for you and be able to put all the stuff into one place. Like you say, hey, um, I, show me everything that I did in Laguna Beach in the last 18 months. And it'll pull all the right photos for all that stuff. Okay. Yeah. So that's image editing. So now we got text, we got image, and then now you can talk to it. Okay. Siri has been a, been a big, it became a, this big upgrade, big leap into actual uh, artificial intelligence. And so now Siri is going to become your assistant to, to now start to do things that we wanted to do five plus years ago. Okay, yeah. so those are three big things that um, uh, Apple's announced. And I'll just say one last thing here. The big news is around video generation. Video generation is a huge hot topic because it's it just grabs your attention whenever you have any kind of AI um, video generation video, whether it looks realistic or not. It's just all over the place. And so uh, Luma AI um, had announced their new product that is free to use right now. Okay, as opposed to Sora from OpenAI, that was uh, a prompt to video kind of experience. They're claiming that it's just as good, if not better, and you can use it right now rather than waiting for another, whatever, three, four, five months. for. But it had like a shorter um, length of videos for, for, the first, for the first generation, right? Um, yes, but much longer than anything else we've seen before. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but the quality is really, uh, they want to be on par with quality, but there's still a lot to be desired. You can, it, as long as you can, you can pass, you can't pass the Turing test, then right. you know, like, oh, okay, you know, this is not as good until you start to realize, oh, it's fooling me. Then, then we're going to put it on a platform that says, hey, this is, uh, you know, getting weird <laughs> yeah. or getting really advanced. 
Yeah, you know, so so this brings me to um, a, a question that people are thinking of, but I feel like we have to retrain ourselves on how to use these platforms because we've always been like up until now, we've been a search focused world. It's like, if you need something, go to Google, but it feels like we are in a completely different world. We almost have to, I feel like I have to retrain myself as to what is possible, how to ask for stuff, et cetera, that, thereby prompt engineering. Right. Uh, and one of the, and maybe you can clarify this. One of the things that we, that we've seen AI start to do is this broad idea of summarization. And give me a document, let me summarize it. Give me an email, let me summarize it. Give me a, a Zoom call, let me summarize it. Have you seen, like, give me your views on summarization. Is this a valuable thing? Can you actually take the summarization and do something else different with the tools? Like, is summarization itself, that was that was just scratching the surface on what AI could do, right? And, and what are your thoughts on just the summarization paradigm as a whole? Yeah, I, I think about it in terms of TLDR. Everything is TLDR. Right? Whether we're using something that was already TLDR for us, our brains are already TLDRing. Right. right. When you're scanning, that's exactly what you're doing. You're picking out certain things and then you formulate some sort of a, a quick summary. Okay. And it's extremely helpful if we can already be presented with that, then it relieves our brain have to do the scanning and kind of picking out what information we want. So um, on the organizing side of the solution for AI, this is huge, hugely helpful. Um, for the for the general masses, let's just say, okay, for the people who really want to read 180 pages of a you know study, well, that that's a different thing. You feel like, hey, you really want to grasp all this stuff. But most of our daily lives are all about getting the quick summary so that we can go know what we want and then go do it. Okay. Um, on top of that, I think there's one more layer above that that I want to mention because I think we kind of get lost sometimes on the actual thing that we're getting, but we forget that. One of the goals of AI is not have you tell it what you want. One of the goals of AI is for the AI to predict what you want next. Hmm. Okay. The whole entire generative AI right now, okay, all it is is just predicting what you're going to say next and what you might say next and what the answers might be next. Everything is next, 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 next. Okay. And so because of that, um, the whole knowledge thing is kind of changed on how we interact with it. Just like you were saying, like, how should I think about this? Well, you should think about it as, hey, does AI know what are the three things I'm, I'm going to want to do next? What are my options in front of us? And say, here's, here's this, here's that. What do you want to do? And we go, oh, I didn't know that. We've kind of started to get used to that over algorithms and stuff like that, knowing what we want to look at. But that's how it's going to speed, our, speed up our work. If you're going to... If it knows you're going to cook a, a a meal and you only like healthy meals and if you only like carrots, all right, it's going to already predict and give you that recipe before you even ask for something for carrots. Right. Right. Is that is that so let me ask you this. Um, how much of this, mechanically speaking, is built into a the AI learning with us? So, for example, I go to chat GPT uh, right now. I call it. GPT, Claude, whatever, and each of those you can start a new kind of interactive thread at talking to the talking to the, the the model, right? So let's say I create a new conversation, I start talking to the model, and maybe I maybe I'm creating a real estate presentation. So I'm talking to it, saying, "Hey, I want you to pretend like you're a real estate expert." I I kind of give it the persona to take. I'm going back and forth. I create this presentation. So I've spent 20, 30 minutes educating the model on what I'm thinking and creating this presentation. So 20, 30 minutes later, it gives me, let's say it gives me a really great outline for a presentation. Then tomorrow I come back, I start a new conversation with related to something else, maybe helping me with a travel trip, whatever. But I know these are two distinct conversations. How do you, do you have any guidance around, do you organize these conversations? Do you label these conversations? Um, should I go back, if I want a real estate presentation, should I go back to the original prompt and pick up where I left off? How, how do you kind of talk through that? Because I, I feel like, it, it, it every conversation seems like in its own silo, but it's also connected. And I don't know of an optimal way to utilize these conversations on whether it can piggyback on what it has learned from me in the last set of discussions. Yeah, that's the that's the AI short term memory right now. 
okay, that's the limitation they're putting on us because we only have so much compute and we have millions of people that might use it and crash the system. So they have to limit what it can know. Now, each one of the conversations right now in ChatGPT, you can, uh, you can see all the history. No different than if you have history for your browser. Okay, so that's how you can re-access it, revisit some of your prompts and revisit some of the stuff. And um, the easiest way, you know, I know how is just either continue that conversation or just copy and paste that whole thing that you want and paste it back in and say, hey, use this conversation and then uh, ah, work with me on the it. next thing. So you have a couple of different ways to kind of get what you need. Um, you can copy it into a PDF if you want. Okay. Um, but you know, the next level is be able to say, Hey, take these 10 conversations and copy it to a PDF for me. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. So, so the, the super mechanical question on this one. So there are different, uh, there are different models out there, right? You got the, you got the, the co-pilots, the clods, the, the, uh, the llamas, the, the GPT fours, et cetera, uh, GPT fours. Is there a, but is the parity between the models fairly similar for an average user? So if I'm on GPT-40, am I, do I flip flop to a different model for, for something different? Do I, am I going to get pretty close to the same results in, since I'm not an expert user, what is your guidance around like which model to use? Cause everyone's like, well, where do I start? One model is free. One model is not. How do I jump into this? What can, what can, what can do little, what can do more? How do you think about that? Um, there was a time when you can use Claude and you would use Claude because it uh, had a larger context window. So what we mean by context window, how much you can feed it in one conversation so that it doesn't max out. Okay. So that, that conversation window was uh, really big in Claude, but chat GPT has since all, you know, uh, brought up. And so in, in regards to that limitation, you won't have that in the future because it'll be so big that you won't even be able to, you know, how long of a conversation you're going to have, right? Before you run out. So people won't even be thinking about that. For most of us, it won't be like a three hour, five hour conversation. It's just, you're in, you're in quick, you ask for some things, you get some feedback, you get asked for something else, you get what you need and you leave. Yeah. Okay. So um, for those big platforms, uh, open AI, and um, Claude, very comparable. Um, and as you know, any of the Microsoft products are all using an open AI version. So there's other ones coming up, but I would, for general purpose uses, there is no difference. Okay. Um, if you, even now, it, these AI models are really good on language, really good on uh, calculations and formulas, scientific formulas, computers that do real computer stuff. When we are asking it to do emotional thing, that's when it, you know, there's a, there's a difference. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I will mention uh, one third platform that people should know is um, uh, it's called Grok and not Grok from uh, X, uh, the Elon Musk product, but Grok with a Q. Okay. And what they decided to do, they decided to just have a model specifically to optimize language. Language meaning talking to it, talking it back, uh, writing me a piece of paper, writing me a, a book, writing me a journal, writing me stuff. And because it's only processing that specifically, uh, then you're, you're going to be able to get uh, responses extremely fast. We're talking about split seconds as opposed to, say, ChatGPT and some other stuff. You can like watch it line by line by line. This just takes the entire chunk of what it computed and just gives you give it give it to you. So give us an example. Computer. Give us an example of that. What what can Grok do that like is more efficient for Grok than it is for ChatGPT? Yeah, uh, what's most efficient is for when I mention language. Uh, imagine that the the most useful thing is for um, telemarketers, AI telemarketers, because when you ask it something, it needs to compute before it says it says it back, and there's a pause. Okay. This language processor is so fast that it talks back right away, and sometimes it might even interrupt it so quick to be able to you know talk to you stuff. So it feels more communicative, feels more natural to us communicating. Okay, that's one of the purposes of that. But you know you don't want to you, if you tell ChatGPT to give me you know two hundred you know business ideas and don't skip any steps, and it's going to have to sit there and write that. We're actually spending time watching it. Yeah. You know, right. As opposed to this, just literally in a blink of an eye, it's all there. 
Right. Okay. So speed wise for language, then we would use a platform like that. So you ask the question about like, oh, you know, what's the difference? The big platforms are all generalized, so there's not that much difference. Um, and then something like Grok is specialized where you're going to, hey, I just want, you know, language answers. I want to translate and things like that without having to watch it, you know, write out word by word, line by line. Got it. I, I'll tell you this. I know you have a couple other tools. I'll tell you this. The uh, These last few weeks, I've learned a lot after breaking my hand. And when you realize that you can't do much without, without your dom dominant hand, you start to get creative. And um, I'll take you through this process, which I may have shared with you. I opened up ChatGPT 4.0, put it in audio, like the audio voice mode. And I just talked to the AI and I said, hey, I'm going to brainstorm a couple of ideas on a next presentation I'm going to do. And I just talked for 20 minutes. It took the conversation that I had and it says, what would you like to do with this? And I said, hey, can you summarize this conversation for me? So it summarized it in key points. I said, great. Hey, can you? And then I said, could you take this and organize it like a keynote? And it organized it like a keynote. I said, then can you build me a 10 slide outline for this? And it built me the 10 slide outline. Literally, Leo, I have yet to touch the keyboard, right? I'm just talking to it. And then finally it gave me the 10 slide outline. I pressed the button one time because it was the last block. It copied the whole block and I pasted it in gamma.app and I said, build slides. And it built the slides and that's the slide that I used in my presentation. So it was amazing because I was able to have a conversation with this AI, not even just talk to it, I have a conversation with it. Then have it summarize the conversation, pull out the insights, have it pull out the insights and build an outline, have it take the outline and build the slides all without me touching a keyboard. And I think the thinking process around this was a little different for me, which is I'm starting to have to think in little Lego blocks in these conversations. I'm starting to have to think in, hey, how do I get the stuff out of my head? How do I get the stuff out of my head and get some insights out of it? How do I get the insights out of it and see if I like it? How do I have it? redo these insights, how to have it reformat these insights, how to have to build stuff around it, right? So uh, just doing that alone gave me so much confidence that, wow, um, those slides, even though I would maybe built them differently, they were really good. That was a really good slide presentation because it was very original. It was all my ideas. And it was just, it, I almost felt like I had a ghostwriter with me through this entire process. How do you kind of react to that? Um, really good. I, I think that's one of the best uses that you can do to teach yourself how to interact in the new world of AI, right? Because uh, I'm telling everybody I, when I do uh, presentations and stuff like that, at the end, I always say, hey, before you do anything, ask AI first, right? Because then you'll see like, oh, this is a different way of doing stuff and it could be much better and faster. Okay. So um, I always think those th things about these things in layers too, because um, I've done several different uh, iterations of these production flows. Basically, it's a production flow that you had for a presentation and you went from idea to the actual slides that you can actually use, right? Or you can even ask it to have written scripts for you. You could have uh, you know, done it through you know, each slide. So that's really good technical wise to like a one-to-one, -one, right? I like to think it a little bit more broadly because I'll just say, hey, remember last Friday at 3.30 p.m., I asked you to do I asked you to do these things. I want to do all the same thing, but with this subject. So now I've shortcutted all right. the stuff that I had to do over and over, right? And it's going to not only know some of the stuff about me, predict some of the, my style and taste and stuff like that, but then also like, oh, just do it just like that. It's not, Again, uh, going back to like if it was a human assistant, like, oh, remember last Friday? Yes, yeah, just do that thing. Oh, yeah, I remember. Now you don't have to tell it, you know, everything, right? right? And then if you wanted to also, you quite probably could have gathered your thoughts, had all the instructions in one prompt, right? And then it would just give you the result, which is the deck. Oh, wow. Right? So I we did this with a, a podcast a workflow for, because... Those of you know out there, if you're producing podcasts, you know, like you, you have to record it, you have to edit it. Sure, we understand that part of it, but it's all the show notes, all the syndication, putting it all in the right place. And then you have to like, oh, build social media content for it. So give me, you know, the captions and all that kind of stuff. Well, give it to me in the form for uh, appropriate for YouTube. Give me the appropriate for TikTok. Give me appropriate for Instagram. 
So now you just put all that stuff in one prompt and you just tell tell AI to do it. And it'll generate five prompts for uh, for TikTok, five prompts for you know Instagram so that you're not having to spend time doing the back and forth thing. So if you already know what you want, you just tell like, hey, these are five steps. Give me all these things all at the same time. So we were able to do that once I had all the assets and the, uh, the transcriptions. I give it give it to AI, and it'll just produce all the things that I need for copy and pasting into the posts, into Facebook, into uh, podcast show notes, and all that stuff. So it's so good that you say that. I was talking to my friend who was, um, you know, doing a, who was building an AI company, and he said something interesting to me. Here's was here was his number one idea on teaching the AI to work with you. He said, Sharon, instead of starting to do prompt engineering where you start to experiment with the various prompts as to what you're telling it to do, what persona it's going to take, et cetera, have it learn about you. So he said, just add, tell the AI to say, hey, can you ask me 20 questions to understand my experience in the real estate business and why I want to make this content? I'll give you all the information that I can and use that to build everything for the future. So I just said that and it asked me the 20 questions and all I had to, and it asked me one by one. And all I had to do was respond to each question and I could do it on voice, which is perfect. And I just responded to each question and it took that as the container of context, which I thought was a really cool way where someone actually said, hey, let me do a little interview of you before to get context before I actually start doing stuff in your image, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. A, a lot of these, um, you you can say that would be like a side tool or a side tip that you you know kind of learn or figured out. Um, a lot of the um, AI companies are also trying to make these as a part of the feature. You click this and then it'll say, oh, you don't even ask me, ask me the questions. I'll just ask you the questions first and it'll mm -hmm. narrow it down yourself. Um, but there's also, uh, this is especially true for image generators, uh, Midjourney, uh, Leonardo. So what they're starting to do is they realize that not everybody can come up with all the prompt, the prompt that they want. So if you just type in a few words of what you thought your prompt wants to be, it'll give you a suggested larger prompt to begin with. So, so we have we can't think about things in like a um, step by step thing. Tell it to do this, it'll do this back. Tell it again to do that, give it the back. We kind of just tell it in general what we want and it should be able to figure out like, okay, here's the three best options they came up based on what it knows. And what it knows doesn't even have to be something that you tell it. What it yeah. knows is stuff that's on the phone that it finds out about where you've been in your photos, you know, finds out about all that stuff that the big questions everybody's asking, like, well, I don't want all my stuff out there and how do I you know, deal with that? But Apple's got this nailed. They've already figured out like, oh, everything is private to you. We're going to encrypt everything. We're not going to touch anything. And I think that's going to be a winning strategy, winning strategy for Apple going forward because the security thing is going to be a huge, huge deal. Yeah. So you, you talked about Grok being a tool. Are there other tools that you're watching and thinking about right now that you think would be helpful for, for us to know? Um, yeah. You know, I think what everybody can use right now are tools that are productivity based. So social media is a big one. Everybody's trying to shortcut, you know, uh, all that stuff. And so, um, you know, we have to think about how our current productivity workflow works and how to use that tool and how many things can that tool take away, you know, for me. Okay. So there are tools out there for, um, there's tools out there for really, uh, just that. So number one, uh, you know, podcast editing. We talked about podcasts here a couple of times here. So there is a tool called Decipher, D-E-C-I-P-R. Okay. And what it does, it helps you create podcasting content. Mm -hmm. So it has an auto, um, automatic writer in there. And what, it, what what's good about these tools is that, oh, yes, you can use ChatGPT to be able to create, you know, content there, but they're trying to roll everything into one, but also specialized. We know that you came here for podcasting. We only know about we're experts on podcasting. Our platform is the expert on podcasting. You don't have to tell me specifically it's about podcasting so that it could generate better performing podcasts or marketing materials and stuff like that for you. So, 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 so how does it, how does Decipher work? Um, it's a writing tool. Let me uh, share my screen here. I think that'd be helpful to kind of just go through it. So uh, as Leo's bringing that up, I will tell you, um, having, working with the tools, at least doing something with it, 
uh, gives you a sense of what it can and can't do. So the faster you can do something with the tool, the easier it is because you get a sense of what it can do. So this is Decipher. Um, so it says repurpose podcast content in minutes. All right. All right. So again, we're shortcutting stuff for how to produce produce content. Okay. And I want to kind of scroll down a little bit. Here they have tools where you can upload directly to uh, to YouTube. Here's your uh, content editor and it'll help you personalize and write. So this writes, uh, so this kind of builds out show notes? Yes, correct. It can build out show notes. So it'll, it can take, it can create transcriptions and build out the show notes and then streamline your workflow. Got it. Okay, I thought that there was a... So would would um would this be a... Um can can you record publish and do everything in this tool or is it just a repurposing of content tool this is a more of a repurposing got it yeah it's not a con it's not a uh like a uh audio or video editor but it's a content editor and assisted and what they're doing is once you have the transcript once you have the 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 content then you can create, you know, audiograms from it. You can create video uh, reels from it. Uh, you can do some planning and stuff like that. But you know, creating you know videos for it that's generic. Got it. And so even uh, so, even if it's a audio based podcast, it builds out generic videos associated with it. Right. Correct. Oh, that's pretty powerful. Right. So uh, <laughs> it shortcuts the audiogram stuff. If you if you're if you normally do audiograms, it shortcuts the reels based on your uh, on your content. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, do you see this as becoming like the, so if once they get traction on something like this, the the only thing that's left is like actually creating the podcast itself, right? Correct, correct. So uh, podcast managers right now have um, these powerful tools at their disposal where they can, I think Adobe has a tool. I, I can't remember what it's called. If you just upload your podcast to this Adobe tool, it automatically kind of makes it makes it feel like it was uh, recorded in the studio, and so it can studioize your podcast, right? Which is pretty amazing. Yep, yep. All that stuff that AI can do now um, really help with some of the tedious stuff that uh, traditionally we would be doing. Amazing. So, so you you have you used Decipher or have you recommended the use of Decipher to others? Well. Um, uh, it's got a free trial and I think people should uh, really use it, especially when they first start a podcast and they don't have a workflow. Um, if we already have a workflow, it can shortcut some of this other stuff and just, you know, repurposing and building more content out of what you've already recorded, which is a big thing for a lot of people. Yeah, it's great. It's great. Do you see, um, do you see more, do you see people creating more, content just because of the plethora of tools available? Um, yes. You know, I, I think a good one to show you guys here. It's a good time to kind of bring this one up. So this one specifically called OSA. Yeah. Specifically uh, creates uh, shorts, short form videos for you without you having to be on camera. So it's going to take the context of your content and it's just going to build these videos. So you give it the script, you give it the prompt and it just builds the video. Right? So um, that's crazy. That's pretty amazing though, right? Now, so it just depends on what you want to put in as your script. Yeah. And then you can have different pacings down here. Of course, you can see the uh, the captions and stuff. So it's just shortcutting a lot of stuff. You can make, if you have a bunch of short messages or scripts that you want to write, like, like well, we hear a lot about uh, real estate. We have a repeated stuff that we say all the time in real estate. You can, build, you can build a library of real estate tips right away very quickly with this. Amazing. Yeah, amazing. I, I see that, um, I see some, you know, some short, th there can be a, if you only had a, a short message you wanted to share and you wanted to pump it out pretty quickly, uh, it could be very valuable to do it Do it this way. Yeah, yeah. So some of these things is becoming easier and easier. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to give it much. Yeah. 
Um, you've talked to me in the past and, and maybe this is on your list of tools about perplexity. Um, uh, but the one thing that I've been using more of over the last few months is just rethinking search. And I'd never, you, we've all been trained to ask a question and give us links, but I'll tell you a real example that I, that happened recently. Um, I was trying to book some travel and I didn't know my travel options. And instead of normally I would just go to Google and say, Hey, tell me the direct flights from John Wayne airport to JFK. That's what I would have said. And, and all it would have done is give me like 20 kayak links is what I would have gotten. So now I was able to go in and say, Hey, give me all the direct flights from John Wayne airport to any airport in New York city. In, in, and, and perplexity came in and said, Hey, there are 31 direct flights daily from John Wayne to New York city. 10 of them go to JFK. Three of them go to Newark. Two of them go to LaGuardia. Here are the four airlines that fly directly to them. The best deals and for the summer end up being on Delta. Click here to go to Delta. Like that's what I wanted. And, and so it, it, it's normally if I was, what I've realized, what you just said was if I was going to talk to a travel agent and ask the question, that's the answer I want. I want the answer, which is first, there are multiple flights because if I'm just used to flying one airline, I forget that there's flights in another airline. So uh, a search engine is completely different from an answer engine. And so I thought that, wow, if I could talk to, uh, 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 you know, like a Google or a perplexity in this case, and it just gives you an answer as opposed to just give me a c accumulation of sources that I can go get the answer. That is very different. Otherwise I have to go through each of the, each of the sites and figure out which answer there is. And I have no idea if it's even true or not, because it's not consolidated all the resources. Don't know if you have something similar, how you think about perplexity. Um, yes, it perplexity is what we wanted Google to do <laughs> and it never did. <laughs> Right, um, we don't need fifty thousand, you know, results. We need the few that apply to what we're trying to do, right? And that's what um, perplexity is able to do. You know, um, it's very difficult for for Google to just all of a sudden change your model and just be like AI first. So companies like perplexity to come in and be able to do what they did, you know, is incredible. And um, it just does does that better than anybody else right now. And so you can get all the sightings and all the pages where it got all the information so that we can, you know, go down the you know, the uh, kind of the cookie trail, you know, if you will, a little bit if we want. But um, it definitely it's definitely seeking to give us the answer, not for us to look through 50,000 pages to get the answer. Right. Do you, so do you, have you made this switch directly to like perplexity as a search engine or do you still use Google? No, we go to, go to perplexity first. <laughs> we wow. want to, if we want to get something, we want to answer something. We, we go there first um, because even when we, cause the, some of these things that we're asking for is it's somewhat specific, right? But Google only gives you all the general stuff. You can be specific and say, hey, what are the three best pickleball shoes, you know, right now in 2024? Then it knows like, okay, best pickleball shoes. Where does it say that? Say what are the best and what are all the different reviews? It goes through all that stuff where Google doesn't, doesn't do any of that. So it's a better search, you know, than we've been used to before. And we've always been frustrated with it. We, how come it's not on the first page? You know, it's taking all this information. How come my search, even though we search the same thing, you got something completely different. And then like, how come I didn't get that? That's more useful to me, all that kind of stuff. And so um, I think this is only, you know, going to get better. This one idea, you know, caused perplexity to be really, really good and really, really useful. And so unless there's something else better, I don't really see anything else better, right? Well, he here's a big, um, here's something important for all of us to realize, which is, the tools like a per perplexity or a Google or what have you, uh, we are having to retrain how we work with these tools. I think that is the, the most important part for me. And I will tell you this, I have never been, and I, I get the campus divided on this stuff, but I get, um, folks will tell me, Hey, let's go find some trending audio on Instagram and make a video about using this trending audio so that you get this push from the algorithm to get your video seen more. So in the, what is interesting to me in that is a lot of people that I know have done that Leo and have gotten a growth in their account or like I have a friend who class close to a million followers right now on Instagram and 
he's been doing these uh, these trending videos or trending music to get these followers. And so it's like, hey, you slice a coconut and water splashes in your face. And that's how the video starts. Or you're uh, you're almost crashing a motorcycle and then you jump and roll off and then you have a conversation or what have you, right? So there are all these trending things that are happening. But the the what's happening after the trend is also important. So you can't just have water splash on your face and then have a terrible message. Then your video is, video is terrible. So you can get these get these things to happen. And I think that's what was happening both on either trending videos, trending audio, or even these black hat or white hat techniques on SEO, et cetera. People are just hacking their way to get some a better positioning overall. They're hacking the algorithm. But what AI has done, I think, is dem democratize the knowledge in a lot of ways because it's just saying, hey, it doesn't matter if you have backlinks. It doesn't matter if you have you know, the right page structure. If you have the right content and the user is searching for that content, I want to show up with that content. That's why you take the top influencers right now on Instagram or TikTok or Facebook, especially like the platform that are doing well. You take the top in influencers. You don't find any of them doing anything trendy. They're literally doing the thing that is to their point, offering value, et cetera. So um, I, don't, I don't know your view on this, but I think what, to me, what I feel like AI is doing, it's democratizing the value of content in a lot of ways. So you don't like hack your way up into the algorithm. Yeah, totally. I think um, uh, I think it was Cody Sanchez that said, said, said this. If you, ca if, you, if you cater, if you cater your content or whatever you're saying to the algorithm, a machine or some sort of a function, you will do, sure, you'll do better at that, okay? But if you cater to your actual audience, the people that matter, then it doesn't matter how the technology changed, that will never change. What people want will never change. So that part of it um, is, I think, what we should strive for. We should use AI to help us be able to serve people better, right? as opposed to trying to hack an algorithm, which you can't see anyways, which changes, you know, over time. And you don't know why it stopped working and all that kind of stuff. But if you are, are doing your content for people, well, then those are your people. They're going to be following you around no matter what, no matter what the algorithm changes or not. Yeah. Is there, so to, to leave, to leave people with like the tactical stuff that they can use. Um, there's a lot of folks that are like, Hey, I know we're having this AI revolution right now. I'll just wait until it becomes mainstream to kind of jump on the bandwagon, or I'll just wait to once all the bugs have been worked out before I can jump in that. Oh, that AI picture that was generated in that presentation. I mean, it's cool, but it's not, you know, I would have much rather liked something natural. Like you come up with these things, which are, which are super interesting. What is, uh, what is your advice to that person that is saying, Hey, I'm just going to kind of going to wait to learn, to dip my toe, to feel like I'm going to, take time to understand this because I don't have the time right now to play with it. Well, the easiest thing is just adopt it to your life, just just as you would have doing Google search. And we talked about that, how, how that's different, how that's changing how you think about getting answers. And if you was if you if you could see the power of it, then you should just ask AI instead of doing a Google search. Um, so that's the easiest thing that, that I can share with them is that, hey, what can I'm trying to do this thing. Normally I would, you know, take a car, but what is it like if I, you know, took a train, right? So you're going to be a little bit curious, but then once you be able to use it a little bit, you'll be able to see. We're still in very, very early stages. We remember when the internet came out, it took how long before she, people, like everybody had email, right? It took, took a really long time. So we're on this, um, you know, although a shorter adoption table, but still long in terms of how this uh, technology is growing. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I'll tell you the, the, the approach that I've taken is the specialist and the tedious approach. Meaning, can I talk to somebody that's a specialist? Like in perplexity, can I talk to somebody, if, if I was assuming talking to a travel agent, can I say, hey, where are the direct flights to so-and-so? Otherwise, I know that I put that task and and procrastinate on it because I know that I'm going to have to do a research on that task to actually then go do the task. If someone told me there's only three flights out of this airport to get you direct, I'm just going to go buy one of those three flights. I just know it. So number one, talking to a specialist has been really good. The second one is anything tedious, 
I'm realizing that there is a better option. So I'll give you an example. Uh, you can take a real estate contract, upload it to, you know, like a chat GPT of the world, and then you can ask it questions. Hey, what are the terms of this agreement? Is there a non-compete clause? Is there an exclusivity clause? Is there a term for this agreement? So a lot of times what I've realized is uh, contracts that I'm not used to, if someone is sending me something to review and it's a, it's a long, fat contract to review, I know that I only want to ask three to five questions of this to see what's in it. And instead of me trying to find, you know, page 32, line three, I can now let the tedious work, the AI do the tedious work, and it has context on, around all of it, which I think is insanely powerful as well. The second, the, the third thing that I, I've been using um, it for Leo is I never, I know this is a GPT-40 thing, but having it take raw data and just visualize it for me, because I'm just realizing that by the time, if someone sends me a spreadsheet, I can just upload the spreadsheet and say, hey, give me some graphs and, and give me some insights around this. And it, it figures out what's insightful on those graphs, which is amazing because otherwise I would have had to take the spreadsheet. I would have had to like build mo a model, go to Excel, figure out the graph, set the left and right parameters. The pivot table would not work well. I could not do it as fast and I get frustrated, but now I can just have it do it quickly. And so I'm seeing both where I can give it a graph and have it give me the data back, or I can give it the data and have it graph it to me. Because the one thing that I believe most people don't realize is that everybody wants a dashboard these days, but they don't know how to build it. So if you give, if you get a piece of, if someone is, if, if you're, if I, if you and I just went to Active Campaign, downloaded all our stats, uploaded it to ChatGPT, and said, you know, try, tell me which of my campaigns are performing the best, it will very quickly be able to do that before we were able to do that. So the anything tedious, I've realized that um, AI can do a significantly better job than I can. Yeah, uh, anything that you can think of, you know, so real estate contract, anything, any kind of law documents. Um, any kind of, uh, you know, long s studies, things like that, that has a lot of scientific jargon in it with a bunch of formulas and things like that. Those are what computers originally were all good for. And now we can access this kind of a language model to be able to do all those things in the back end and, and you know, give us the, the answer. So totally, like there's things that you didn't even realize, right? Like I... You pull up a, this is for bookkeepers and accountants too, right? You have bookkeepers. You just have to go line by line and pull up the right numbers and make sure everything matches up. And QuickBooks helps a little bit to categorize it a little bit and stuff like that. But imagine you didn't have to do all that. It's just a bunch of mumbo, mumbo jumbo. And you say, hey, add this together. Give me a graph. How are we trending? What is our uh, profit and loss and all that stuff? And it'll just build all that stuff for you from a bunch of stuff that we couldn't recognize, you know, in our, with our own eyes, right? So those things, it does extremely well at. Yeah, I think um, the really starting to reorient our thinking on how to use an assistant in a lot of ways. And if the assistant can't do it, then it's up to us to train the assistant to do it a little bit, which is, which is very empowering. Um, Leo, what are some, what are some, uh, if some closing thoughts for you where you're like, hey, if you're jumping in the world of AI, do this to get started what would that do this be um i think just interact with uh, chat gpt it's the easiest thing you can do it's the most accessible uh, most powerful thing out there right now uh, because with the new releases it can see it can talk it can hear it has an able it can't smell yet okay um, but literally it can do all of those things for uh, communication and not, and kind of like doing research or knowledge or whatever you're trying to do to get your stuff done. Right. Uh, yeah. I think our lives are going to be, you know, um, be able to do a lot more things better and faster, uh, because of it. But I, 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 I saw some stats, uh, before there's a, you know, there's billions of people in the world, uh, roughly half of them are on the internet, right? And then that's, well, that's what? Three and a half billion, something like that. Maybe four billion people. And we've got roughly one to 200 million uh, ChatGPT users. Of those couple million people that have accounts, uh, use it, okay? And we have 350 million in the country here. Right, so there's a frac still a fraction of our entire population. Right, and of those one to two hundred million, only less than 
5% actually use it on a weekly basis. Yeah, there's so much opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So um, that's probably the easiest thing to do because the easiest thing to do for us to, is to be able to type into something and get exactly what we need back out. Yeah. I'll leave everybody with this. So um, uh, for us Southern Californians, we have Disney, Disneyland right next door to us. So we take it for granted. My children take it for granted. And I was, uh, we were in Disneyland recently and I took a photo of the Disneyland parade. And the only thing I could get is a selfie of me with some parts of, you know, Disney main street with Goofy's butt in the background. Right. And so I took this picture and I uploaded chat GPT and I was like, Hey, uh, can you analyze this picture for me? And it literally said to me, Hey, you're probably at Disneyland on main street in front of this ice cream store. It looks like, um, it, and it looks like Goofy in the background. Like that is insane, right? And then I said, hey, can you estimate what time it is? And it says, based on where the shadow is and based on where the lighting is, this is probably at, you know, in the evening between 3 and 5 p.m. The, the, the stuff that they would only do in Mission Impossible and, you know, these James Bond movies, we could literally do right now by uploading a picture from our cell phones and just asking it questions about that. And I, I did not believe that. But just for the fact that it would pick up Goofy's behind is insane um, overall. So that gave me a ton of confidence that I don't have to analyze a lot of pictures, but when someone throws something wild your way, you could probably do a lot of cool things with it. Yeah, we're just learning. We're just learning how to use this new, new technology. We just don't know yet. We just don't know what we don't know. And until we can start asking questions like, can AI do this? Can AI do that? Um, just, the, just yesterday, um, I realized, you know, everybody knows Zapier, right? We connect the two apps together and we have a workflow and it automates it, right? But did you know that there's this thing called Zapier Central where you talk, you just tell the bot what you want and it builds the automation for you. So now you don't have to build the automation anymore. It's amazing. So I made this graph um, when, I, when we started talking about all this AI stuff about a year and a half ago um, of, oh, you can do text to text, you know, experience with AI. You can do text to image, right? And you can do image to image and you can do text to video and all these modal things that you can do. What I didn't realize up until now is that you can do text to automation. That's awesome. Right now you're just telling it what you want and it gives you an automation back to enhance your life. And it just, and like imagine that it just built it for you. So cool. Right? Like text to, text to a, uh, you know, a meal, yeah. right? The text and all of a sudden they're like it did all these things and all of a sudden your meal comes out of the tray. That's amazing. That's amazing. Um, Leo, where can where can people find you if they want to connect with you, get more of the stuff that you're working on? How can they contact you? Uh, I'm on Leo Chen Re for everything. Um, uh, I um, actually share a lot of uh, thoughts and stuff like that on threads because I find that it's the easiest, less cl uh, clutter thing for me to do just to get my thoughts out. Uh, so you can find me there. You can find me on Instagram, uh, Leo Chen Re, also for Facebook and um, uh, as well. So uh, happy to chat about all this stuff. We, you know, if you're connected with me, you'll see that I'm on some of the tech groups that I either manage or um, run and uh, give some information out there. But always feel free to reach out. Love talking about this stuff and kind of nerding out a little bit. Awesome. Hey, if you wanna, if you want to work with uh, an agency that can build your stuff out for you, create automations, efficiencies, and make things work in a smooth way. Definitely talk to Leo and his team at Systemology. And Leo, appreciate you, man. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks.